Perry for three. Rebound by Peyton Crispin. He's going to put it back. And oh, he's got it. The Lakers get a three. Welcome back again. He's a part of the Lakers. Can't get the shot to go. And the Lakers win the ball game. Go! Do you like to work with metal, fire, electricity? Would you like to make money doing it? At Southwestern, we can help make your dream a reality. With our degree and certificate programs in welding, you'll be prepared for a career in the welding and fabrication industry in as little as a year. Check out our website and let Southwestern spark your career in welding today. Southwestern Oregon Community College gave me the opportunity for a new career doing something I love. I'm Amber Yardley and three years ago I knew I needed to make a career change for myself and my family. With the support of staff, my academic advisor, and the instructors at SWAC, I now have a dream job and the confidence to continue my education. Contact Southwestern Oregon Community College and start the journey to your new career today. This is Southwestern's Dental Assisting Program. In just one short year, you could be a dental assistant. Sign up now for your one-year dental assisting certification. Congratulations, you just got accepted into college. Now, how do you pay for it? Fortunately, there are several options out there to consider. Follow this simple step-by-step -step guide as you figure out how to pay for college. Step one, fill out your FAFSA. Ah, free application for federal student aid, FAFSA. Your FAFSA will determine if you qualify for financial aid including grants, some scholarships, work study, and federal student loans. The good news is most people qualify for some financial aid, which is why this is the most important step in figuring out how to pay for college. Step two, figure out how much you may need to borrow by weighing your college costs versus your contributions, including any grants or scholarships. Some easy arithmetic will make your math teachers proud. Let's say your college of choice costs $30,000 a year after factoring in tuition, housing, books, lab fees, and a laptop. Now, let's pretend that the money found in your family swear jar, your bowling scholarship, your federal grant, and the money you saved as a scuba instructor contributes $10,000 to your college fund. Voila! This is how much you will need to cover through other means. Many families consider student loans a reliable option. Step three. There are two categories of student loans you can consider, federal and private. Federal loans are made by the government and private loans are made by private lenders. In some cases, families use both to cover the cost of college. Compare student loan options by looking at their interest rates, repayment options, and fees. Interest rates vary depending on the loan type. Federal loan rates are fixed, while private loan rates can be fixed or variable and are determined by your credit quality. Adding a cosigner, like mom and dad, may help lower your interest rate. Repayment options for federal and private loans are also different. Some providers require in-school payments, some don't. Take a look at these now and choose an option that makes sense for you. Watch out for fees. Fees can be charged upfront or in repayment, and they add to the total cost of the loan so you end up paying more back. Step four, factor in other benefits when researching a loan. Some reduce your interest rate and some give you cash back. For example, Discover student loans have no fees and give you a cash reward for a 3.0 GPA or equivalent. 
Let's go through these steps one more time, just in case you needed a refresher. Step one, fill out your FAFSA. Step two, weigh your school cost versus your contributions. Maximize any free money like personal savings, grants, and scholarships before considering loans. Step three, compare interest rates, repayment options, and fees. Step four, take into account any benefits the loan provider may offer. Don't forget that you can continue to reduce the amount you need to borrow with scholarships. If you are an eligible current or college-bound student, you can enter to win a $2,500 Discover Student Loan Scholarship Award. Head over to collegecovered.com to learn more about paying for college and enter to win. No purchase or loan required. Let's try not to <laughs> get myself up here. All right, welcome everybody to the physics and astronomy lecture for spring term. Um, very happy to have all, all of you come and support what we've been doing as part of our physics program and our other programs in terms of our engineering program and the rest of the wonderful things we've been putting together here at SWAC. We Love to bring speakers in, um, particularly entertaining ones, no pressure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but we do want to take we do want to take this time at the end of the term to sort of um, acknowledge some of the stuff that our students have been up to this this term before we turn things over to before we turn things over to Dr. Fisher. So I'd like to have Crystal Hopper come up and she'd like to sort of summarize some things that our department's been up to. This one's going to. Okay. Yeah, we'll Hi, everybody. I work as a volunteer with our uh, with SWAT's physics and engineering department. I'm actually going to read this because uh, it would help me keep my thoughts organized. <laughs> Uh, we're glad you could attend the Physics and Astronomy Lecture Series tonight, and we appreciate the support for our growing program. I wanted to take a moment to mention some of the great things we're doing in our department. However, given the historical significance of today as the 75th anniversary of the D-Day invasion, I'd, I would like to give everyone a moment to reflect before we delve into science. In addition to the lecture series, we have had students participate in NASA-funded research through our affiliation with the Oregon NASA Space Grant Consortium. Recently, physics students Bailey McMahon, McMahon, I think I got that wrong, sorry, and Isabella Trifolo Miley presented their research work on solar flare mechanisms at the OSGC SCORE Symposium last month. Isabella and Bailey both received an $800 Stipend for their work and copies of their posters will be hung in Kalita Hall here at SWAC. By the way, we were there and they did awesome. Our team stars participated in the Invent Oregon semifinals in Portland last month and was able to advance to the finals at the end of June and received a $2,000 prototyping grant for their project on self-tightening shoes for the elderly or physically limited. We have continued with atmospheric balloon launches through our SPEAR group we are planning to complete one more launch with the current team over the summer. We're looking for interested students to continue the SPEAR group next year. Anyone interested in science or that is interested in the idea of launching high altitude balloons can reach out to Dr. Coiner. Beginning July 1st, we'll be hosting an interdisciplinary exhibit, Remembering Apollo 50 Years Later, One Small Step, A Half Century of Giant Leaps. This exhibit features work from students ac across a number of departments addressing what impacts the Apollo program had on society today and what challenges await future sp space exploration. The exhibit will be in SWAC's Eden Hall Gallery from July through September. We encourage you to come back and check it out. We appreciate your support as you help us provide these memorable and rewarding opportunities to our students and the Bay Area at large. Thank you.
thank you guys again, and thank you, Crystal, for that. And without further ado, I will turn it over to a slight, to a much more entertaining speaker than myself, Dr. Scott Fisher. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, hello, everybody. Um, thanks for coming out tonight. I see a couple of uh, familiar faces. It was uh, nice to drive back down uh, I-5 and Route 38 again today um, to, to come and see you. And it's a beautiful day here in Coos Bay, so it was a nice afternoon to, to walk around and enjoy downtown a little bit also. Um, I am a, a, a friend and colleague of Aaron, and I would like to say thanks to him. Um, he is the driving force but, uh, about getting sort of the big program going here, and he's uh, making connections um, between Southwestern with, with a lot of big universities, OSU, um, UO, we're working with the Space Grant, and, um, and, and for me, it's a wonderful uh, to be part of a something that's growing, and I'll be very curious to, and interested to, to stay engaged with everybody down here over the next few years and see what happens. Um, and so thanks, this is the second round, and so I had to come back with some new stuff, um, <clears throat> but, but I, I have some of my old stuff too, because in case there was nobody here last time. And, um, and, but we have a, a very interesting topic to talk about tonight, and that is exoplanets, and I am just absolutely fascinated by this topic, and, um, and we'll get to those exoplanets here in a minute, but um, if, if, you, if, if you don't know, um, I'm a professor in the physics department up at UO, and I have a very fancy title called the Director of Undergraduate Studies, and what that means is I'm the leader of our undergraduate physics program, and that's sort of akin to the advisor, and I'm looking forward to seeing um, our first Southwestern student uh, transfer up there in, in the not too distant future. So um, I like to start off with, um, uh, with the story of our talk, and this is something that I started a year or two ago. As a matter of fact, this might have been the very first time I ever did it was, was at this talk last year. And it's more to get me oriented um, and say, let me remember what the heck I'm supposed to talk about tonight. But let's talk about a few of my favorite topics here this evening. Um, a short perspective check, a cosmic perspective check. I think one of the most interesting things uh, about basic astronomy is, um, is, is um, seeing if we can blow y'all's mind about how big actually everything is out there. It turns out we're big in many ways and small in many ways also. Um, my second favorite topic is me, it turns out. And so for better or for worse, you're going to hear some of that. Um, and I'm only half joking. Yep. And um, third is um, some interesting um, astronomical discoveries. And this is, again, related to this broad idea of exoplanets. And um, we'll introduce those, those in a few minutes. And something I really enjoyed last time is, for better or for worse, we had some stump the astronomer, and, and, and you all came very close to stumping the astronomer. And, and so I, I brushed up, and I, I'm, I'm ready, and, and so bring some questions um, at the end. And, and, and so, 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 so seat, seat belts up, and, or tray tables up, and seat belts on. Um, let, let's go somewhere. I'm not sure where, but we're going somewhere. Um, first of all, I noticed some students in the room, and I also heard uh, through the grapevine that y'all are getting some um, extra credit for coming tonight. Thank you very much. And um, it, it, yeah, get your, be sure to get your extra credit on the way out. For the public, you have, I'm giving you extra credit right now. Let me, let me tell you, so right now, plus two, plus two points for everybody in the room, Aaron, plus three. And, um, but look, let me give you a tiny little overview of me. And, and one of the reasons I love coming back here, um, and this is directed to the students, is that um, I'm you. Well, wait a second. Um, I was you uh, many years ago, where n now equals like 40. Um, but, but like 30 years ago, only oh, yeah, 30, thank God, not 40 yet. Um, I went to a, a community college in Florida called Lake Sumter Community College, where I got an AAOT degree in general science, and then um, spent a year as an exchange student, and then transferred to the University of Florida, which is the exact analog of the University of Oregon. Um, a big state school, and um, I'm very proud of that, and I'm proud to come here and to speak at COCC and Bend and Lane, because I want to encourage you all to continue what you're doing, and um, I found my experience at a community college to be very formative, and, and by the way, it was the only way I could go to college, because of course I had financial issues, and it made um, my time at, at Lake Sumter um, really set me up to, to where I am today. So, you know, well, well done, and, and kudos to you all for doing that. Um, I make a joke in my class, I show this slide in my class, and I see this thing about the University of Florida, and I make a big thing where I say, go Gators, and the students go, oh my God, and I say, okay, no, go Ducks. Um, and, and so I turned out that I'm very excited to be at Oregon, and the duck and I were tight, me and the duck, let me tell you. And this is a photograph from a football game uh, two seasons ago where I was invited to be a guest coach, and you got to spend the day with the student athletes, 
And, um, and let, let me tell you, those, um, that was an, an impressive day, not just to be able to watch the game from the field, not up in the stands with the common people, the students, um, but um, to, to see the preparation that the athletes go through. That was a very, very impressive thing. Those, those, um, those folks have a full-time job on top, of, on top of going to school. But let's not worry about the, that so much. I'm, I'm actually, what I would like to highlight right now is I'm, I'm very proud to be uh, a faculty member at the University of Oregon. And one thing that is uh, some area related to this talk tonight is I'm also the director of Pine Mountain Observatory. And if you saw me speak last year, we talked about Pine Mountain and some of the good things we're going to do up there. And um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll summarize some of that stuff for us again today. I think that uh, the, the, the biggest thing I want to come to just uh, at the moment reiterate to, to, to folks and the folks haven't met me before is I've been at UO for six years now, so I, I not, it feels a little, you know, a little old to talk about what I did before I came to UO. But this is my second career. My first career, I was a, what's called a staff scientist at, at a very large telescope. As a matter of fact, it was the fourth largest telescope in the world. When I worked there, it's the fifth largest telescope in the world right now, called the Gemini Observatory. And so what I did is I brought to UO about 15 years of observing experience at extremely large telescope facilities. And what drew me to UO was the combination of the opportunity to be uh, to teach and to move into the academic world and the educational world, but also to to get my my uh, little paws on Pine Mountain, which is a wonderful medium-sized observatory, which is about 30 miles east of Bend, on top of a mountain, not surprisingly called Pine Mountain, and um, and we get to spend the summer out there observing with students. We've done some cool things. We built a robotic telescope, and we're doing all sorts of research out there that we'll talk about later on. Don't worry so much about that. Um, undergraduate director thing except for the students and um, what you have here is you have a person that knows a lot about UO classes and how to transfer there and what your general reg you know all the advisor stuff so if you're interested in that come up and uh, talk to me afterwards I'd love to give you a card and stay in touch with you um, that's a that's enough about me let's move to the astronomy while y'all um, actually came here today and I promise I'm not going to pop quiz you this time but we do have to start off with some vocabulary and the vocabulary is quite simple. I want us to know what an actual definition of a planet is. And there it is. We can all read it. It's a, a large object that, um, that orbits a star. But I think that um, one thing that's interesting for us to think about is planets do not have their own light. And so when we look up in the sky tonight, by the way, about by midnight, there's going to be a beautiful, big, bright planet up in the sky, in the eastern sky, Jupiter. And when you see Jupiter, that's not Jupiter glowing with its own light. That's reflected sunlight. So that's sunlight that left the sun, went all the way out to Jupiter, and reflected off the, the cloud tops of Jupiter and back into your eyeball. And that's going to be important when we talk about these exoplanets. We want to realize that planets themselves are not luminous. They do not, they do not give off their own light. They reflect light that's near them. And these are two, uh, two very modern uh, pictures of two planets, Mars, the great red planet over there, and also Neptune. And I just love the contrast of the colors. Um, but I want to show a little detail on those two. And these are just models, of course. Let me, um, let me show you uh, one of my favorite uh, pictures of the solar system. And it turns out that these, these planets are real. OK, let's be careful. These, these models of the planets are real. And the thing that is most interesting to me about these, not only is it a cool looking graphic, the, the planets are shown to scale. So what that means is the relative size of the planets in this image are true. So um, let's see if I can use this laser pointer again on screen. Let's tug them off. You've got, um, you've got uh, Mercury, oops, Mercury down here, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And, and let me get this right, right now. You'll notice there are eight planets, <laughs> not nine like there used to be. Pluto. Oh, I got some death stares right there. Maybe we'll tell you about Pluto here in a minute. But, but I think the thing about this is, is this is our first sort of hint at, at the relative size of things. And, and that's real. So if I like to sort of think the first thing is if you take our beautiful little blue marble, Mars, or Mars, Earth, I was looking at Mars, um, Earth, it would fit roughly inside the great red spot of Jupiter. And quick sidebar, you're all invited to come to Pine Mountain. And if you do come to Pine Mountain this summer, we'll show you Jupiter through the telescope and you can see the great red spot with your own eye. And, and um, it's kind of a neat thing to be standing there and looking and you see this tiny little red spot and you think, <laughs> our whole planet would fit in that right there. And, and so there's our first sort of hint at, um, at the scale of things, but it doesn't get real until we go to the next slide. 
and there are those exact same planetary models, but now we add the sun. And if you can see the little, if you can see down here in the edge, our little Earth boop, is right down there um, at, at the at the bottom of the screen. And again, this is a a two true scale model. And and I, I like to say to the students, by the way, many of these are our slides that you see in the first couple of days of my Astronomy 122 class. So if you come to UO, you're going to get a head start. Um, but this is our first cosmic perspective of the term. 109 planet Earths will fit across the diameter of the sun. And, and that takes a minute to sink in, really, because how many of us in this room have actually thought of 109 planet Earths before? <laughs> Why would you? There's one Earth, right? Not 109 of them. But, but this already kind of brings together this, this, just this immense sense of scale that we have to try to get across. And I like to think of it as a, a beautiful little... Uh, a necklace of blue pearls just right across the sort of face of the sun and, and you take 109 of our planets <clears throat> and place them side by side and it would fit across the disk of the sun and that is something uh, and by the way it's a photoshop promise we're not this close to the sun <sighs> okay um, but this is again just to show you the relative size of the earth and and the sun itself that um prominence that you see is called a coronal loop and these are often um, things that, um, th these are the sort of flares that sometimes can cause geomagnetic storms here on earth and if you wonder why well you can see the scale of these things even a small coronal loop is bigger than five ten maybe you might even be able to fit 20 20 earths um, in in one of these loops and that's why even though the sun is very very far away it has a direct effect on, um, on us, not only does it heat us up, but we also um, can have electromagnetic effects. By the way, the sun is what causes the aurora and the northern lights, um, and all sorts of effects like that. But, but, I, but I, what I want you to do is, um, is look at this picture. Um, first of all, I have to give you a homework. Don't look at the sun. Oh, this is one of my own, my, my personal nightmares is I'm going to wake up some morning and the headline of the, of, the, of the Eugene newspaper says, two UO students blinded by, no, no, don't look at the sun. However, the next time at sunset, you're getting a beautiful sunset over the coast, maybe take a look at the sun, take a peek. And if you see it looking like this, remember Dr. Fisher standing up here on the stage right now telling you 109 planet Earths will fit across that. And it takes a few times to sort of see this, to internalize sort of what you're looking at. Um, but I urge you to do it. It's an interesting thing, and it, and it takes a little while to change your perspective. But when it, when it changes, um, you, you can't go back, it turns out. So this is a one-way one street to science literacy that we've, that we've put you on. Um, but I'll tell you something that I like to think about. If I get to go out there and take a glance at the sun during sunset when you can see it, I like to imagine this picture right here. I sort of like to think that there's a person on a beach on a planet around one of those stars. And they're looking at their star thinking, I wonder what my star looks like from out there. This is what our sun would look like from there. Our sun is a star, just like every point of light that you see on the screen right there. And by the way, our sun is sort of a C student. Not too heavy, not too, not too light, not too hot, not too cold, not too bright, not too dim. You know, it's sort of a, an average star in a, in a sort of the suburbs of the galaxy in some sense. And, and, and I, f I find um, an odd comfort in the fact that, that we blend into the background a little bit like this. And, and so if you can somehow mentally put yourself on another star out in the sky and you look back at us, boom, that's what we would look like. Just a point, a point of light up in their sky, just like they're a point of light in our sky. And, and I think that's an interesting perspective. And I tried to explore this perspective a little bit because I wanted to find a way that we can translate these scales to, to, to us, to, to folks who don't think about this every day. And, and I came up with this right here. Turns out that um, if you're a Duck fan, you know that this is a place um, where it never rains. It's a big joke about Autzen Stadium. So this is Autzen Stadium up in Eugene on the campus of, of UO. And this is a photo taken from Google Earth. And it turns out in Google Earth, you can uh, measure distances. There's a ruler inside Google Earth. So you can click on your house and click on Southwestern and know exactly how far away you are from it, that sort of thing. And I was surfing around one night, and, and I was like, well, I wonder how big that is. And it turns out that if you measure from, um, let me try something cool here. If you measure from one side of the stadium over to the other side of the stadium, that is um, 665 feet. 
And so um, I'm six foot four. Does anybody want to take a guess at what 109 times six foot four is? 650 feet, approximately. You could fit 109 of me, by the way, sidebar, if there was 109 of me, we would form an army and we would rule this planet. Benevolently, okay, but still, nonetheless. And, um, but you could take 109 of me and uh, 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 tip to tail, put me 109, and 109 of me would fit right across Otson. How interesting is that? You compared to a football stadium is the same as the earth compared to the sun. And that was the moment that it started to sink in for me. Because it turns out, I, you, know, you go to Autzen, and you're standing there, and it's a huge stadium. And, and the next time you walk by a big stadium, walk up to it and kind of give it, give, it, give it one of those. Give it a little push. How much did you influence that football stadium? None. Exactly how much the earth can influence the sun. And I always say to the students, the next time you're sitting in the crowd, think of you, a little earth, sitting there inside the stadium, and the stadium is the size of the sun. And, and, and I think that that kind of brings it home a little bit because we, we're, we're working with this idea of scale and how can we scale down these immense distances that are out there to make it sort of um, graspable um, by us. Well, let me see, let me turn this off real quick. I'm not sure how that, what that does. There, there we go. Hey, I don't know, it's up there. Um, so look, let's do, let's do this real quick. Let me try one more thing. Uh, we might be stuck with that stuff, sorry. So, look, go out, don't look at the sun, but if you can look at the sun, briefly, keep in mind what you're actually looking at, the scale of this thing. And here's something I also like to bring up to us. So, what constellation is this? Who, who's feeling bold tonight? Just yell it out. Orion, sure it's Orion, my favorite constellation it turns out, and not visible in the summer, but a winter constellation, a beautiful winter constellation that we can see. And, and I want us to realize something, and I know we all know it sort of inside, but when you look up at the sky, we sort of lose this ability to realize that you're looking at a three-dimensional picture. When you look up in the sky, we don't live under this thing called the celestial sphere, which is a, a model that we had for the sky for many, many years. Um, we live in a three-dimensional universe. And so when you look at Orion, even though it looks like it's just up there on the sky, what Orion actually is like is this. This gives a little 3D sort of hint about, um, ab about what's going on up there. And let me see if I can turn this laser pointer back on. You are down there on Earth, and what I like to think about is that if you look at the three stars in the belt, the middle star is almost twice as far away as the other two stars in the belt. So this star in the middle right there, boop, oh, sorry, that one in the middle, is twice as far away as those other two that are on the edges of the belt. And, and it doesn't look like that to us when we see, because it has to do with the way our eyes perceive distance, but when you actually measure the distance to those stars, even though they're right next to each other in the sky, they're very distant from each other in reality. And, and that has, um, when, of course, we, we meeting humans, we, under, we understood this a long time ago, but, it, but when you start bringing the 3D nature of the universe into play, is when we can first start to understand the true physical scale that we're dealing with. And, and it's hard to do, but um, our friend uh, JP uh, Metsav A. Inio, um, it's, it's a gentleman, I, I looked him up online, he's got a wonderful website, by the way. He found out an interesting way to help us visualize this 3D nature of the universe. Um, JP is a triply cool person. He's a physicist, a computer scientist, and an, an awesome photographer. And uh, you combine those three talents together and you get stuff like this. What JP realized is that he could take images of celestial objects, and by the way, this is called a nebula. And a nebula is a, an immense cloud of gas and dust that lives in between the stars. By the way, space isn't empty. You all have been lied to your entire lives. There's lots of stuff out there in between the stars. Um, every point of light that you see is a star in the Milky Way. Then the nebula is out there in between the stars. So take a careful look at that, because what JP figured out how to do is to take a picture like this and make it do that. And, and with a little bit of computer trickery, what he allows us to do is to trick our brain into seeing the 3D nature. It's not like that. 
That's, that's what we see when we look at a picture, or if it was bright enough, you could look up and see your eyes. But what we're actually looking at is a three-dimensional situation where some of these stars are in the front of the nebula. The nebula is sort of in the middle of the frame. And there are stars that are, that are back behind the nebula. And, 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 and to me, this is, again, helps us uh, sort of not characterize, but understand what we're looking at when we look up in the sky, when we can see something like this. And he's made several of these, um, of these animations where he took a real um, astronomical image and animated it to, to basically trick our eyes into seeing the 3D. And this is a, a particularly interesting one. Um, here you, we're going to have, a, I just have a slight uh, an, a, a audience participation moment. Take your hands and make a bowl. Make a bowl shape with your hands. And, and, and if you put your, and imagine the, your, your hands are painted that beautiful turquoise color. What you're looking at is a bowl. And, and, and that, the turquoise is sort of on the inside of the bowl. And JP has the bowl rotating back and forth like this. At the very center of this picture, there, well, right below there, is a little star cluster. And that star cluster is, 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 is just given off as much energy as it possibly can. It's full of very young, hot stars. And it's, they're giving off so much energy that they're literally carving a bowl out of the massive cloud of gas and the nebula, the cloud of gas and dust that they just formed at just a couple million years ago, formed out of. And, 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 and again, it's, it's a way to visualize the 3D aspect of the sky up there. And, and so let's keep in mind the, the, this, the fact that we have 3D stuff going on when we come back to our solar system and look at my, I'm going to go ahead and admit it in public for the first time, my all-time favorite planet, Saturn. Earth is third. It's, it's right up there. Um, so, so maybe second. I don't know. Earth is pretty cool. We like we live here and such. Okay, Saturn. Saturn is still the best. Um, and so, but but I'm going to tell you right now. This is a view of Saturn that you cannot get from Earth. You cannot. Promise you. You have never seen um, this particular view of Saturn, um, unless you were riding on the side of the Cassini spacecraft, you weren't, um, when it visited Saturn for about 10 years. And the reason that we know that is two things. You can see the North Pole of Saturn, which is pretty darn cool, but you can also see the backside of Saturn and the shadow and the rings, which is kind of a neat thing. And, and so this is what Saturn would look like with our eyes. This is what we call a true color image. So the, the spacecraft was literally in orbit around the planet when it took this picture. And I like to think of that as a pretty darn good picture of Saturn. There's lots of detail. There's lots of, there's, there's lots of, um, lots of structure you can see. And I'm going to show you what I think now. I'm going to make an argument for you. This, that, this is probably the best picture of Saturn that was ever taken from Saturn. And now this one is the best picture of Saturn that has ever been taken from Earth. By the way, Saturn is not purple and pink. This is an infrared image, and we could Photoshop, scientifically Photoshop, the colors of the image to make them whatever we wanted. In this particular case, we wanted to highlight the fact that the rings are made of very different material than the, the planet itself. The planet is a, a gas giant. It's primarily hydrogen and helium, a bunch of other stuff mixed in there. And the rings are a crushed up moon. The rings are made of little tiny dust particles and little particles of primarily water ice, some carbon dioxide ice, and things like that. And this, this image highlights the fact that they're made of different things. And also, the spot that you see just below Saturn is its largest moon named Titan. And I'm going to argue that this is the best picture that's ever been taken from Earth because it was made with a very large telescope, the Gemini Observatory up on top of Mauna Kea, with um, an adaptive optic system, which just means uh, fancy words that means you get extraordinarily detailed images from Earth. So we've seen the best picture of Saturn from Saturn, the best picture of Saturn from Earth. Now how about I show you the best picture of Earth that's ever been taken from Saturn? And there it is. By the way, you're in that picture. Were you on Earth in July of 2013? Who was not on Earth in July of 2013? There's nobody here that was less than six years old, right? Okay, okay, now, okay. We're all of a certain age. We were all, we're all in this picture. And by the way, <laughs> it's that spot. That's us. And, and I'd just like us to, to take a moment and note, A, there's no string hanging that thing up. <laughs> and B, there's no turtles all the way down either for the philosophy students in class. I love this picture because to me, this is the profound nature of this image. Again, is one of those things that takes a while to sink in. Every human being that has ever lived and died is in this picture. 
because we all live on that beautiful blue little spot. And um, I will even admit that um, one of, at least one of us, maybe two, I'm not sure, I'm looking at Aaron right now, um, I know for sure that I'm in this picture because if you were in the Western United States, Japan, Australia, or Eastern Russia on, let me make sure, um, 1.27 p.m. on July 19th, 2013, if you were somewhere on Earth in that, you are literally in this picture because that's the face of Earth that was pointing towards Saturn when Cassini turned around and snapped that image. And one of us may have walked out onto the UO campus with their stopwatch and looked at the stopwatch and at exactly 119 looked up in the sky where Saturn was and went and waved. And yeah, okay, that was me. Did you do that? I'm the only one. <laughs> so anyways, I'm king of the nerds. Thank you very much. Um, and, and if you look down in the lower right corner, you can see a mosaic of um, photographs that people submitted of them waving at Saturn. So this was actually kind of a deal, right? NASA, NASA knew so precisely where Cassini was that we realized that the Earth was going to be in the field of view of that picture. And so they made a big kind of PR release and said, everybody go out at this time and wave at Saturn. And damn it, if not like 5,000 of us actually did it and, and went and, and made a picture. But so I sort of like that idea. And it brings, again, this, this, this sort of sense of a, immense scale to us. And, and I think that's what I'm trying to get across tonight for us. So speaking of that, let me try to... Uh, let me, this is something that we, I kind of went over before, but let's do it again real quick. We got some new folks. I want to try to give us a, a, a tool, a tool that all of us can use to share this information with anybody else once you get out of this room right now tonight. And, and let's, let's call something that I like to call the grapefruit scale. And if you take the sun and you shrink it by a, some really large, a really large amount. Oh, let me see if I can get, I can't get rid of that stuff. I'm sorry, that's a bummer. Um, the, uh, the, you shrink it, it doesn't even matter how much. You shrink it by a factor of 10 billion, which is an incredibly large number. But I don't care so much about that. I want you to keep one thing in mind. We're going to shrink the sun down until it's the size of a grapefruit. And right here, imagine a beautifully bright, if you can't even look at it, it's glowing so bright grapefruit right in my hand. And I lied to you earlier, you actually are going to get pop quiz, sorry. And, um, and, here's, and, and here's the first pop quiz, and here's how we're going to do this. You know what is really nervy and really difficult to do? Raising your hand in front of 200 people and saying out a, a, a yell, yelling out an answer. So what we're going to do is called a chest vote. This is how I do it in my class. You can't get them to raise their hand, but I can make them make do this. One, two, three, or four. And the beauty of you all voting just like this is nobody else can see your vote. I can, but nobody else can. And since we're having an informal, friendly um, chat tonight, you're leaving allowed to talk to your neighbor for a second. But let's do a chest vote real quick. What do you all think? When the, the sun is the size of a grapefruit, how big is the earth on this scale? One, uh, two, three, or four. So, inner, oh, okay, hold on. Oh, I see lots. I see stuff. Oh, the students are scared. Oh, oh, now there was a bold person who was holding her hand up in the eye. Well done. Well, right, not very nicely done. So, interesting spread. We've got ones, twos, and threes. No fours? Nobody's taking the golf ball? Ah, that was the throwaway answer. No, you know what? It's, it is. It's two. It's the, it's the, oops, I'm going to go one more time. It's the tip of a ballpoint pen. And I, if I had a ballpoint pen here, I'd pull it out and show you a tiny little tip. And right, it makes sense, right? You've got a golf ball, and you need something about a hundred of the, or excuse me, a, a, a softball, a softball, or a, a grapefruit, and you need a, something that would be a hundred that would fit across. So, okay, that was the easy one. Now, um, with no context whatsoever, same scale. You've got a glowing grapefruit right here, and you've got a little pen tip that is the size of the Earth. How far away is the Earth on this scale? Now look, I'm, I promise you're not going to get any demerits if you get it wrong. It's because, again, you have no context whatsoever. So we got ones, do twos, there's a three. I, I, the bold statements in the back. We got ones and fours in the back. I think y'all would win this one. I think I see more twos than, it, than anywhere. 50 feet. So glowing grapefruit, tiny little pen tip on the other side of the stage. And that's how far Earth would be from the sun on, on this particular scale. Quick note about 
uh, the ballpoint pen, ball pen thing. When I first learned this scale, I learned it as the earth is the size of a BB. Now, who in here knows what a BB is? Almost everybody, not quite everybody. I used for three terms, I taught this and I used the term BB. And, and then I asked one of the, uh, on an exam question, I said, how big is the earth, blah, 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 all the big is the earth. And I had a foreign student write an answer, and it was a young lady, and she wrote, the sun is the size of a grapefruit, and the earth is the, is the size of a BB. And in parentheses, she put a baby bee. And I was like, oh, so good. I'm like, no, but yes. I, I did not realize that, of course, not everybody knew what a BB is. And, and so anyway, so now we use the ballpoint pen tip, things, things they do not teach you in, a, in, in professor school. <laughs> you know, so, so anyways, I had a, a real moment of enlightenment for me that you can't, and the poor student was like, how big's a baby bee? I'm like, I don't even know how big a baby bee is, but anyways, it worked. Um, she got full marks, by the way. She got full points. And, and, and so, so here we have, we've got a glowing grapefruit and 50 feet away a baby bee. And, um, and now, now, now we're taking it to the next level. There are many stars up in the sky, folks. You know that. You go out tonight, you're going to see a ton of them. It's going to be beautiful out there tonight. Glowing grapefruit, bang. 50 feet away is the Earth. And I'm even going to give you a hint. On that scale, Pluto would be probably up there. What is the name of the big Newman Avenue? Newman Road or whatever it is. Yeah, Newmark, yeah. So it's the one, if the glowing grapefruit was right here, Pluto, the solar system is roughly the size of this campus. That, that's, that's the way to sort of think about it. And on that scale, how far away is Alpha Centauri, which is our neighbor, which is the nearest star? And that's not even, you know, the, you know, the, the ones far away. This is the nearest one. So we, oh, good, good. I, I, I like this crowd, man. Everybody's just holding them up, two, flying twos right now, just like this. We have twos, threes. I'm looking for the students right now. Oh, we have a discrepancy in the front row. Um, this, this is the mind-blowing moment. 2,500 miles from here. I, I promise, we, I did the math. It's, that's, it's legit. And that's the neighbor star. Don't forget to sugar. Okay, wait, wait, whatever. So, so it turns out that I lived in Washington, D.C. before I moved here, and I flew back six months or so ago, and we, and, and we took off, and we flew right by the Washington Monument. Oh, it's so pretty, nice Washington Monument. And I just had this moment where I imagined a little glowing grapefruit, boop, right on top of the Washington Monument. And that is how far away the nearest star is from our glowing grapefruit right here in this auditorium. And that's the neighbor. Tonight, when you go outside and look up, you're not going to be able to see something quite this good. This is Pine Mountain, but not even a pretty close. Every individual point of light you see is a star. And with our naked eyes under a really dark sight, you can actually see about 2,000 individual stars. And those are our neighbors. Those are the stars, the 2,000 stars that are sort of in what we call the, the solar neighborhood. And, and on average, if you go out on a beautiful night and, and you look at these stars, on average, those stars are 10 or 20 times farther away than what we just talked about. I don't even know what is 20 times farther away than Washington, D.C. <laughs> you know, it's around Earth, you know, sort of. Actually, it would be roughly around the Earth. So I think that is the, this moment that it takes a little while to sink in. But this is the scale of the things that we're actually looking at. By the way, in this particular picture, you can see the beautiful stripe of the Milky Way also. And that, those are stars that are literally hundreds of times farther away than the ones that we can see individually. Those are the ones that are near the center of the galaxy. And let me try to put that in context for you for just a second. This is a picture of a spiral galaxy. It's not the Milky Way. We can't, now the Milky Way is so big, we have no way of sending a camera far enough away that it could look back and see us. But this is a galaxy that we think looks a lot like our Milky Way. It's a spiral galaxy. It also looks like a beautiful big pinwheel. And, 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 and I want to show you something. I'm going to flip, do something back and forth a little bit. Let me show you how big this thing is. First of all, I'll give you a, one sense of scale. That neighbor star, Alpha Centauri, is, is four light years from us. Don't matter so much what a light year is, but the number four is important. Our neighbor is four units from us, and our galaxy is 100,000 units across. And, and, and if you watch, watch this little graphic sneak back in here again. Let me see if I can sneak him in. See this little, this little fella right down there below coming in? 
that's a tiny little graphic of the duck. And, and that duck I placed where our solar system is in the Milky Way. So I, we sort of like to think we live in the suburbs. Downtown, Portland would kind of be the, the big center, the, good, the center, the nucleus of the galaxy. And, and uh, I always make fun of Junction City, which is a tiny little town outside of, of Gain, or Gainesville, of, of Eugene, which is out here. In, and, and we live in the burbs. We're about halfway between the center of the galaxy and the edge of the galaxy. But what I want us to realize is if we look at that, if we look at that graphic sneak in there again, every star that you have ever seen with your naked eye is underneath that graphic. As a matter of fact, I could shrink that graphic down to about one pixel, and still, every star that you can see with your eyes is right there, are the stars that are very, very close to us and in our neighborhood. And I think that, and, and I didn't even, you know, I sort of academically knew this stuff, but when I started teaching the class, I started putting these slides together, and it really changed my perspective, too. Because when we look out, we think, oh, the sky. We're seeing the sky, all the sky. But in reality, what we can see with our eyes is just a tiny little bit of our own galaxy and just the neighbors for, in, in that matter. So this is kind of, I think, a, a neat thing. Um, and, 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 but how does our, our star system sort of fit in all of this? And, and in an interesting way, here's another definition for us, the, a star system is a star and all of the material that orbits around that star. And by the way, that can be planets, that can be asteroids, that can be little uh, gas and dust. It's a, it, there's a big cloud of hydrogen that surrounds us and all sorts of neat stuff. But if you add it all up, we call it a star system. And by the way, the name of our sun is also Sol, S-O-L, and that's why we live in the solar system. We live in the system of Sol might be a little cooler if that was S-O-U-L and we lived in the system of soul, but okay, we'll take, we take what we got. We got the solar system. And um, not to be super provocative, but if you'll notice, there are eight major planets in our solar system. Oh my God, I, just, I saw somebody just go like this. So it's clearly we still have some rich emotions about Pluto and, and what happened, but, but please come up and see me after this is over if you want to talk about Pluto. Um, and, but, let, but now I'm going to tease you even worse and, and say it turns out that we actually don't have eight planets in our solar system. We have eight major planets and one, two, three, four, five um, dwarf planets. So yeah, I'm here to hope you make a little bit, make you feel a little bit better as when we were all kids we only had nine planets and as of now we've got 14! Yes, even better. It's not selling very well right now. But anyways, 14 planets, folks. Listen to what I'm saying. It, it's, it's better, and I'm going to do you one better. If that didn't help, let me sell you something for sure. Let me show you. Let me, let, I'm speaking to this, this one young lady right now. I'm looking right in her eye. Um, let me do you one better. In October of 2018, a telescope out in Hawaii made another really interesting discovery. We discovered another dwarf planet just not even a year ago, like, it's like eight or nine months ago. Sidebar, science is happening now, like today. And well, I didn't do any science today, but I'll try to do some tomorrow. And, and science is not just something that a bunch of bald white guys did 100 years ago in a book. Science is happening right now. And, 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 and in astronomy in particular, we are in the middle of a revolution we're making new discoveries all the time. And, 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 and we even are discovering things about our own solar system. And, and so this was to, by the Subaru telescope um, um, out on, um, on, on, in Hawaii. And, and by the way, I think this is an interesting point down here at the bottom. I am a firm believer in the fact that technology drives science. And let me be careful. Often, technology drives science because we build wonderful new machines like the Subaru telescope and Gemini and Keck and all of the Hubble. And then we make observations that we have to understand. And so when, when a telescope makes a new, a new discovery or an observation like this, this is exciting for many facets of science because now we have more data to look at and also to understand. And I think this is, um, so let me show you a piece of this real data. If you look at this, at this uh, uh, thing blinking back and forth, every point in the light, or excuse me, every point of light is a star, except for the one, let me try this one last time, put this on here, uh, right about there, just below that red light, you see that little guy blinking back and forth. That's the new dwarf planet. 
These, um, these two pictures were taken um, about three hours, about three hours apart. So the, in the three intervening three hours, the stars did not move, but that object moved in its orbit. And we can map how um, it moves over time. And by the way, um, that's how we can actually map its orbit. And so this uh, very large pink oval that you see is the orbit of this new star. And all of our, what we think of as the traditional solar system, is buried down really inside that inner ring right there. So these are planets that are very, very lightly connected to the solar system, but still part of our system because they orbit the sun and they're under the gravitational influence of the sun. This particular object, um, 2015 uh, TG, um, its farthest point away from the sun is about 180 um, times farther than the earth. And so again, this is a big, big distance, but even this thing, if we had a glowing grapefruit right here, Pluto, the inner solar system is about the size of campus, that thing would still be orbiting within Coos Bay you know, maybe down by the coast or where the mill or something that is. But again, compared to where the nearest star is, Washington, D.C., by the way, let us not forget that, even an object like this is still in town. And so um, I hope what the picture that we're building is that the solar system is a tiny little um, self-contained unit, and then between that and, and the next star is a lot, a very, very deep and a very, very, very um, large amount of distance even to our nearest, our nearest neighbor. And so let's show you a, an updated um, version of, of the solar system. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight major planets. One, two, three, four, five, and six dwarf planets. Fourteen planets, folks. And, and I'm going to... I'm going to bet you a dollar, mm, there's a bunch of you, so I'm going to bet you collectively one dollar, um, that um, you invite me back here, you know, again, maybe next year, a year after that, there's going to be more of these dwarf planets. And, and the reason is, is there are new, new telescopes that are coming online. One telescope called LSST, which is being built down in the southern hemisphere in Chile, and that telescope is going to make a map of the entire sky every week. Once a week, this telescope is going to make a map of the entire sky. And what that's going to allow us to do is find hundreds and hundreds of these objects that are moving out there. And I would not be surprised the, the year after that telescope comes online, which was supposed to be 2020, um, I'll come back here and we'll have eight major planets and... <laughs> 15, 20 dwarf planets, you know, who the heck knows, as many as, many as that thing can find. And, I, and just one quick comment about Pluto to help the emotional pain that we're feeling in the room right now is the reason that we had to reclassify Pluto is that Pluto is the first object, the first of these new objects that we discovered. And so we were faced with the, with the idea, do you want to have a solar system that has nine planets in it or thousands of planets in it? And who wants to remember a mnemonic that has like 15,000 letters in it, right? The one, my mom, seven pizzas or something. You know, we know that one. But, but, but who the hell can remember one with 1,500 planets? So let's not worry about that. So let's get back to this idea of, um, of looking out. And our lovely star system, the system of Sol, is, is, um, would look like any of these other star systems if we were on another star. And it turns out that now we're finally getting to the, uh, to the part of the talk that I wanted to talk to you about, and that is exoplanets. And what exoplanets are, are the exact same definition as we saw earlier, except with the addition that these are planets that orbit stars that are not the sun. And, and the first exoplanets were discovered in the 90s, and we had a little talk um, bef before the talk started about how it is amazing that basically everybody in this room has been alive during the time that we discovered these planets. And that is something. I'm going to make a case in a few minutes. Uh, I'm going to try to be pro profound with you for in a minute, but let's just kind of hold tight for a second. When I started teaching in 2013, I wrote this slide, and I wrote that we know around about 1,000 planets around other stars. And, um, and, and don't worry about that. And then I kept teaching, and every time I went and looked, I had to update 2016, 2017, we're up to 3,500, 
3,500 in October 2017, 3,700 in January 2018, and as of October, I think that's the last one. No, it is not. March 1st, 20, this year, we cracked 4,000 exoplanets. Now, let us have a moment of zen here and think about that. We have 14 planets in our solar system. It's going to be more later, but at the moment, 14. And we now know of 4,000 planets. Let me just let me be careful. We don't know of them. We have detected, detected their signal. These planets are there. It is, the controversy is over. They're there. We can't see them. We can see the effect of them on their star. 4,000 planets outside the solar system. That is a profound statement. Um, and, 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 and what we've done is over the last few years, we've discovered as enough of these planets that folks that I would call a computational astronomer can start to do statistical analyses of these. And what the statistics are telling us is that on average, every star in the sky has one planet around it. Now, the way this works is some of those stars have none. Some stars have 14, like us. But on average, if you average it out, basically every star in the sky has one planet around it. And your first homework for the evening is to go outside tonight, you know, here, you know, at an, oh, 10 o'clock or so, 10.30, it'll be pretty dark, and just take a glance up at the sky. And if it's clear, one planet around every one of those stars. And, and, and that is something. The sky is forever changed. Even 15 years ago, 20 years ago, when y'all were just, just coming around, the, the, we knew of no planets up there. And now we honestly have to accept that there is one planet around each one of those stars. It, it, is, it, is, a, it is absolutely um, a, a profound thing. And, and, and so we, I just wanted to confer, sort of make the, reiterate and make the point that these are not just theoretical things. We have discovered them and confirmed their existence through observation. And, um, and, 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 and that's pretty cool. Now, you might say, where are the pictures? Well, we don't have many pictures, it turns out, because it's hard. Let's just um, take into account what we just, what we just learned about the scale of the universe. I've got a glowing grapefruit in my hand, and there is a pen tip 50 feet away. And on top of that pen tip is a telescope. And that telescope is looking at another glowing grapefruit in Washington, D.C., where there is also a pen tip 50 feet away from it orbiting that star. And this is the problem we're trying to tackle. How do you detect something so tiny, so far away, right next to an extraordinarily bright object? One of the... the the sayings that's kicked around a lot, it's trying to detect a firefly in front of a searchlight while the whole thing is on fire. Yeah, and, and, and 2,000 miles away. Um, and, but but I, I'm here to share, we actually have a couple pictures of these exoplanets. These are the, basically the only ones that we have at the moment. And the exoplanets are the little spots of light that you see. Beta Pictoris B is the little spot of light there about 4 o'clock. HR 8799 has three planets around it, the three spots, and RxJ, rah, 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 that number, is the planet up there about 11 o'clock. So the ones that are relatively close to us and we're pretty far away from their stars and are pretty big, we can actually get pictures of them. But that's it. This is the best we're going to get for the time being. These were the um, data that were taken at the largest telescopes that we have right now. And so for the time being, we're going to have to settle for these little um, spots on images to, to learn about. So we can't see the surface. We can't say anything about that too much. But we can actually learn quite a lot about these things. And I'll give you in the last few minutes here, I'm going to show you how we, how we can do that. Um, I love this picture because uh, it's just it, it's a, a beautiful um, picture and sort of a, a representation of our galaxy. And this is again, is a, is a, it's not a real picture. This is a, a hand-drawn picture uh, by an artist named John Lumberg, and and John is an astronomer who's also an artist. And what he did is he tried to illustrate just how much of the Milky Way that we've actually searched the, for these planets, and it's a tiny little fraction. The fraction of the galaxy that we've searched is just the, under that little yellow, that kind of yellow triangle right there. And it's, it's I, I love it because it's artistic, but let's take a, uh, let's take a crack at, at, at um, sort of figuring out how, how much of an area that is. 
And so if you shrink the solar system down to the size of a quarter, so again, all these weird scales, but now take that whole solar system and shrink it down to the size of a quarter, so all of us are in there, then the Milky Way is roughly the size of North America. And, and so, you know, again, this is, again, a weird, like, let your brain wrap around that for a second. There's, a, there's a, a, an actual quarter right there in Eugene, Oregon, right, right there, you know, in Eugene, and, and, and that's the solar system, and our galaxy is the size of North America, by the way, including uh, Canada and, and, and Mexico. Um, mm, not bad. Um, so how are we doing as far, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, we've searched Connecticut, and Connecticut is tiny. And, and I don't know, what, what county are we in right here? Coos County. Thank you, sorry, I just learning things out Oregon still. Um, it turns out that I went and I was like, Connecticut, that's a small state. I live in the west now. Connecticut is smaller than Lane County, by the way. And Lane County is where Eugene is. And, and so out of the entire area of North America, we have searched Lane County for exoplanets, and we found 4,000 of them. That bodes well for the future. That in just in our little neighborhood, we're already finding tons and tons of these planets. Ooh, what's going to happen when we can search the size of California, you know, and, and, and the entire Midwest? I'm telling you, folks, thousands of these things. You keep me come, keep, let me keep coming back and giving talks, and every year I'll update you on and, and how, and how many we found. So look, it's a whopping big area that, um, oh, I didn't know we had an animation. So there you go. There's Connecticut, by the way. <laughs> Quick sidebar, you might see this little comet right there that's 1.2 big islands. I also gave a, a version of this talk out in Hawaii a few months ago, and, and, and everybody's like, Connecticut, where the hell is that at? And like, no, well, let me just scale it to Hawaii. It's just about exactly as big as the big island of Hawaii, is, is how much that, that, we've, um, that, that, that we've searched so far. So, so how are we finding them? I, 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 I wasn't going to put these in here, but tough cookies. I got you a captive audience. Um, I have got to give a shout out to this mission called Kepler. Um, Kepler is a, is a satellite that is still in orbit. It's, not, it's kind of broken and not working so much anymore, but that's okay because the, the new Kepler named TESS, T-E-S-S, -S, um, was recent, recently launched. And so um, let me show you how Kepler um, has discovered these exoplanets. Kepler has been the primary way that we've discovered these exoplanets. And, and one of the ways, and not, not one of the ways, the way that Kepler detects exoplanets is through something called transits. So these planets are orbiting around their stars, and by the way, their solar system, some of them are, are oriented face-on to us, some of them are at an angle, and some of them are edge-on. So when the planets orbit, they orbit right in front of their star. And this is a simulation of what Jupiter would look like going in front of the sun. And this is what um, Earth would look like going in front of our sun. By the way, did anybody see the transit of Venus or the transit of Mercury that were a few years ago? I know you would, yeah. Oh, there we have one person who did. So it just turns out this is a pretty rare happenstance, but a few years ago we had uh, Venus went in front of the sun and we got all sorts of cute, cute pictures. But the point is this, when the planet orbits in front of its star, it blocks a little bit of the starlight. Look at that big black, that big black spot there. All of the light that would be reaching us from that star is being blocked by the planet. And, but keep in mind that we can't actually see the planet. We can't see the planet go in front of the star because the stars are so far away, they just look like spots. But what we can see is this. Even though we cannot what's called resolve the planet, we can watch the brightness of the star. And on a typical plot like this, you would take maybe one picture of the star every two or three minutes. Train your telescope on it, and every two minutes take a picture. Click, 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 click. And over the course of about, oh, in this case, you can see maybe 10 hours, one observing night you will see the brightness of the star will actually dip and then come back up. And by measuring how long that dip takes, that's how long it takes the planet to orbit in front of its star. And how deep the dip is, that's the area of the planet compared to the area of the star. There's a few other things, whether it's curved on the bottom and things like that. But we can learn a lot about these exoplanets just from a pretty simple looking graph like that. 
we can learn how big they are because we can measure how, what fraction of the star that they block. And we can also measure how far away they are from their star because we can measure how fast they move in front of the star. And if you tell me how far away it is and how big it is, I can give you an idea of its density. Is it a gas giant? Is it a rocky planet like Earth? Is it, a, is it an icy world like Neptune and Pluto? And so even though we cannot see these things directly, we're still learning a lot about them. And, 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 and let me um, give um, homo sapiens and humans a props. Props to us for, for being able to figure this out. This is, an, this is a real testament to, to our species to do that. And so where has Kepler found planets? Everywhere it looked. These are the, the called the Kepler field where Kepler looked. And every one of those colored points is where it discovered a planet. You can't see it so well, but if you look over there, the green spots are a little bit bigger than Earth. The, the orange ones are even bigger and the, and the red ones are, are big, big. Um, but the point being is in that little tiny wedge of the galaxy that we looked at, we basically found planets across the whole thing. And that gives us hope that we can look anywhere in the sky and see the same sort of, sort of proportions, that roughly one planet around every star in the sky. And now, um, hold tight, I can't resist but show you uh, one, one, one bit of science. This is not my science, this is, this is folks that's done work that was, uh, that was done at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. But, but I, first of all, please read this comment. You don't necessarily have to understand the math or, 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 or how the folks made this plot, but, but these plots say something to us. And, and as, uh, as scientists, we, we learn to sort of deal with data and how to represent data. And the fact that, that these, these points, by the way, the, uh, the green points were discovered by Kepler. These are the, through this idea called transits by watching the planets go in front of their, um, in front of their stars. And the red points were discovered in another way called radial velocity. Don't worry about that so much. But, but what I want to show you on a plot like this, particularly this lower right one right here, is those points, they're grouped together. They're grouped. They're not just scattered all across that plot. And by the way, there's nothing that says they couldn't be scattered all over the plot. But the fact that they're grouped together is showing us a relationship. And what this relationship is, is um, the, how long it takes the planet to orbit its star. Down here, short periods, it goes really, really fast around the star. Long periods over on this right side. And basically how close it is to the star. And, and, and what that's shown us is that there is relationship about how planets form. And by looking at plots like this, this is how we're making predictions about how many we're gonna find in the future. And this is at the heart of science. We have planetary scientists right now that are using the data that we already have in hand to make predictions. And now we're gonna, we've launched another, the new Kepler called TESS. Over the next few years, TESS is gonna, I, 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 I will bet you all one, I'll bet each one of you a dollar. That's like a hundred bucks, it's no joke. You bring me tests two years after test starts getting data, you bring me back here 10,000 exoplanets, book it. 10,000 of these things out there. And so as we discover more of them, we're gonna be able to fill more and more points in on the plot and learn more and more about the relationships between the planets and their stars and their orbits and all of this sort of thing. And, and really, really, it, 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 it's, 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 it's gonna take off in a, weird, in, in, a, in a weird and excellent way. So I'm looking down here, I've got uh, four slides after this, so hold tight, let me, give me an extra five minutes. I wanna tell you about what we call a habitable world. Uh, habitable, some of these planets are what we call habitable and some of them are not. The definition is a habitable world uh, contains the basic necessity of life as we know it, including liquid water. <clears throat> Basically, we're looking for life that is similar to us right now, and we require water, and so we're looking for planets where there could be liquid water. Um, it does not necessarily mean that it has life, but the conditions for life are there. And around each of these stars is something called the habitable zone. And if you look on the left, there's a picture of our solar system. The green ring around the sun shows what we call the habitable zone. 
And you can see that the earth is just on sort of the inner edge of the habitable zone of the sun. And by the way, Mars is right on that outer side of, of the edge too. And what that, green, what that green ring shows is how close and how far away from the sun can you be to have liquid water on your planet. The other two are just examples of lower mass stars to show you how the habitable zone changes with how much energy the star gives off. And, and by the way, that's why we're finding some of these planets that are really, really close to their stars and some that are really, really far away. So the point is, is that um, there is this thing called the habitable zone. And what I wish I knew, I don't know, is what percentage of the exoplanets that we found are in the habitable zone of their stars. It's not much, it might be 1% or even less. So for every 100 of these planets we find, only one-ish is gonna be in the habitable zone. So again, this is saying something about the, how special Earth is uh, to be right there and have formed and lives in the habitable zone um, of, of, of the planet. So I, I gotta throw one equation at you. I could not resist. I have got to throw one little bit of math at you. And this is a really interesting equation called the, the Drake equation. It was come up by a, a, uh, with, by a gentleman named Frank Drake, who's still alive today. And Frank sat around one night and uh, had two or three beverages of his choice. No, I'm just joking, I don't know that part. Um, but, but he came up with a really interesting idea. How can we estimate how many civilizations like us are in the galaxy? And by the way, he came up with this in the 60s, the late 60s, early 70s, something like that. So it was a while ago, uh, well before we knew anything about exoplanets. In his day, there were nine planets, nine, and that's it, just the ones around our sun. And the way he tried to estimate this is to take four numbers and multiply them together. And he said, you know what? You find the total number of habitable planets in the galaxy, multiply it by what fraction of those have life, multiply it by what fraction of those planets have an actual civilization, and multiply it by how many of those things are around right now. And you think, oh, that's easy, multiplication. I have a calculator, you just take the numbers and multiply them. If we knew the numbers, we could actually do that. But what we don't know is um, how many civilizations are there, how long it takes, and this sort of thing. But here's the good news. Since we've discovered the exoplanets in the last 20 years or so, we can finally put one number in the Drake equation, and that's the first one, that there are probably billions of habitable planets in the Milky Way. And, and so, this is kind of the way science works. We chip, chip, chip away, chip away at a problem, and, 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 and this discovery has helped us chip away at this particularly thorny issue, trying to figure out how many civilizations like us might be out there. And, and so we're not there yet, um, but boy, are we doing good. And this is the last new um, discovery I wanna talk to you about. And again, in late 2018, another observatory out in Hawaii called the Keck um, Telescope, um, confirmed that there is a, a planet neighbor, um, um, orbiting around a star called Bar Barnard Star. And this is, again, this is not our closest neighbor, but it's, I think, our second closest neighbor. And so, um, not only these planets are not great, well, let's be careful, they are all crazy distances away from us, but they are not astronomically crazy distances, you know, meaning on the other side of the galaxy or some other galaxy, they're just kind of in the neighborhood sort of thing, only, you know, 20, 30 light years away. This one's about four light years away. And so um, I like to think of this as a sort of a segue into, into what I, what, into, into re really the, the last slide, and, and that is this, and let me, um, let me be, try to be profound with you for a second. I am at this point firmly convinced that the discovery of exoplanets is, is probably gonna be the most profound discovery that we make this, our generation, loosely our generation, everybody, the 100 years that's represented in this room right now. Um, folks, I am convinced that, I like to think sometimes of what I call the, the long game. And that's not 10 or 20 years from now. I, I like to think about what is it gonna be like 500 years from now a thousand years from now. And, and, I, and I think in the year 3019, there, there's gonna be some students sitting around in their astronomy class, and they're you know, gonna, gonna learn about planetary history of astronomy and take the USB stick and stick it in their head and download all the whatever, you know? And, and, and in the Encyclopedia Galactica, 
there's going to be the, a little section on the 2000s. Just like right now, if you go to Wikipedia and look at the 1000s, go, you know, go look at what was going up in, in 1019. I don't know, War Hastings or something. I don't know, something like that. Some war in, in Europe. Um, and a thousand years from now, our era is going to have a little paragraph. And I am convinced that in that paragraph is going to be the words, these are the folks who discovered the planets that we are now traveling to. It's us. We did that. We're not going there anytime soon. But we are the people that are making the map that our species is going to follow to the stars. And that's something. We should be proud. We should all be proud that we were here when that happened. And so I just want us to say, then I want us to walk off and say, look, this is, we did this. So our species did this. And we were around when it happened. And, and, and I'll leave you with this particular, uh, with this picture, again, of us. So now that's a black and white picture that Cassini took of us through the rings of Cassini. And um, thanks for letting me come. And Aaron, thank you for bringing me back. And the tech guys. And thank you all for, for taking an evening and, and coming to let me prattle on about this stuff. Thanks. <laughs> And I would also like to take a shout out for the person who left this little, uh, this little note up here that says you were doing great, <laughs> just in case. All right, well, we, we did promise a little bit of Stump the Astronomer Q&A, so if you have any questions, feel free to, you can come down and ask. It's probably easier than me trying to track you down up, <laughs> up at the top of the auditorium, even though I do realize that students do like to hide in the back. <laughs> <laughs> I mostly don't bite much. But if we have any questions, I can bring the microphone as need be. How do you find out about going to Pine Mountain? Oh, so that's a great question. Not, not, not absolutely rated, but how do you find out about going to Pine Mountain? So um, as of last weekend, Pine Mountain is open every Friday and Saturday night to the public. Um, and so um, please um, come and see us. And there's no reservation or anything. We want you to just come one up. Um, I would urge you to get to Pine Mountain maybe, oh, 30 minutes or so before sunset. By the way, the sun's setting around you know, almost 9 p.m. now. And walk around during the, during the daylight and see it. And by the time the sun sets, we'll have the telescopes open for you. And um, this summer, it turns out that Jupiter and Saturn are gonna be up all summer, which are glorious through our telescopes. I urge everybody in the room to come during new moon, not during full moon. It turns out we, we hate the moon. Well, we don't hate the moon, but the moon is a big bully and it's so bright we can't see any of the other deep sky stuff. So, um, so come on up and, I, and I'll even make a special um, invite to you. I, I will be up there the first weekend of every month with UO students who help we docent the public nights. And we go up, um, it turns out that during the summer, new moon weekend is the first weekend of every month. And so we welcome you to come up if you go to Google or Yahoo or any of your favorite search engines and type in UO Pine Mountain Observatory, we're the first hit. And we've, there's uh, Google Maps and information about visiting. But, but seriously, folks, we'd love you to come up there. If, you've never, if you haven't seen a really dark sky recently, come out there, it's a beautiful sight. I, I don't know all the technical terms here, but I read that we're sort of, Technology, uh, folks that are trying to improve access to the internet and stuff like that, they're throwing up more and more gunk up into the sky. And um, what are your thoughts about that? I am really mixed about this. So right now, what's going on, you know that um, SpaceX and is launching uh, 12,000 satellites, and it's gonna give us worldwide internet coverage. Um, and I am um, completely torn about this because, A, I love the internet, and I think that we should all have access to it, but B, it is going to be a terrible situation for astronomy. Um, I wish I probably can't find one real quick, but as, look, as we're observing with telescopes, when a satellite flies by, that's a whopping bright stripe that goes right through our data. And it turns out that what um, SpaceX is proposing is when all of these satellites are launched, there's gonna be one satellite per
per three square degrees in the sky. So look, I know there's probably some beavers and some other folks in this room right now, but if you make your hands into roughly the size of an O, about this big, and sort of project it up on the sky, that's about three square degrees. So you think there's gonna be one satellite in the sky in every area about that big, and they're all moving. So I'm not exactly sure how dramatic the effect is gonna be, but there has been an extraordinarily strong pushback from the astronomical world because of this. And, and I'm not so sure which way it's gonna go. I think ultimately what will happen is the astronomers will be very clever and will have to figure out ways to filter out you know, that, that signal. But that's, um, that is actually, um, that is a sad moment right now. It, it, it's, a, it's a bummer, we're not sure actually how it's gonna go. The normal satellites were not so bad, it's not so bad, you see them, you, you take them out, but these are gonna be everywhere, and that's what we're worried about. Mm. Next. All right, I'm kind of evil sometimes, and I, and I will hijack things to ask questions of my own, but last time you were here last year, we, we talked about TESS a little bit, and you said it was gonna be Kepler on steroids. Now that it's been up for a year, yes. you, still, you still kind of have so, that same I, I do. So, so, so um, I, I mentioned this telescope called TESS. By the way, if you want to learn about TESS, again, at your favorite search engine, just type in NASA, T-E-S-S. -S. And um, uh, Kepler was uh, launched in nine, oh, I don't know, about 10 years ago now. So maybe, you know, it was the mid-2000s. Um, and so it actually has 1990s technology on it. TESS is a new uh, um, spacecraft that was developed through the last 10 years and just launched a year ago. And I've only seen one image from it so far, but it's working beautifully. And so the, the advantage that TESS has over Kepler is Kepler saw, not, not an O, but Kepler saw a piece of the sky about this big, and TESS is gonna look at a piece of the sky like this. And so um, on any given image that TESS brings down is something like 300,000 stars they can detect, and, and they're gonna monitor that many for these planets. Where, where Kepler may have had, oh, 10 or 20,000 stars in its field, so we're gonna have 10 times as many objects to look at, and if the statistics hold true, we're gonna have probably find about 10 times as many um, exoplanets, and which is why I'm fairly confident in betting you all a dollar that we're gonna have 10,000 exoplanets here in the next year or two. So it, it's working well, and the data should start flowing in the next six months or so. I'd seen some, I'd seen some of the same original images, and, and it is rather astonishing to look at the scales of just it, what it, we're it's, looking it's, at it's, it's dramatic, folks, seriously. Should, and, and I would look, let me give you um, great kudos to the NASA team that's running that website. It's very public friendly. Please go and take a peek. It's how, shows you how the telescope works. There's, there's raw data, there's processed data. It, it's a really neat site to check out, yeah. Any other questions? If you have individual questions, I'm sure Dr. Fisher will gladly I'm going to hang out so. for a while, so go <laughs> down and say hi afterwards. <laughs> All right. If you have a chance to, please, as you're, as you're leaving, make sure to sign in so that we know roughly how many people were here. It makes it easier for administration to actually let me do this more often. <laughs> <laughs> so if you get a chance to sign in, there are some sign-in sheets out, uh, out there. There's also some flyers for the Apollo Remembering Apollo art exhibit that comes that comes in July that that we will be hosting here in hosting here on campus. So I'd love to have you guys come back for that too. Thank you, everybody. All right.